to again welcome everyone here uh, to our uh, to our 16th uh, 16th publication success interview series. Um, it's really great to have you here, and we uh, we appreciate you coming. Um, I continue to you know jot down your names, where you're from, and your area of research um, uh, in the chat, so we can get to know everybody. Um, and depending on where you are, where you're joining us from today, I'd like you to wish you a good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I hope no one's up in the middle of the night. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Avi Stamen, and I'm the CEO of Academic Language Experts. Um, and this is the Publication Success Interview Series. During these interviews, I have the honor of engaging in conversation with innovative thought leaders in the world of academia about how they're influencing the world of academia um, with the goal and hope and aim of providing authors a better understanding of the publication process, the publication landscape, and how to build bridges between authors, publishers, and funding bodies. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Lot Jaspers, uh, founding partner and director at Yellow Research, and uh, Dr. Julie uh, Quickla, uh, professor and director for the, STEM, uh, for the Center for STEM Education at the University of Southern Mississippi. For the past 30 years, Lot has gained broad practical experience in the issues of technology transfer and obtaining EU grants in particular for the ERC, Mary Curie, infrastructures and research for SME grants. Uh, in her work for the Dutch government and the Dutch University Association, Lot has gained extensive experience in the legal and financial aspects of EU FP agreements. She's been involved in developing strategies to imp improve rules for participation, the EU grant agreement, and several consortium agreements. In successive framework programs, she worked as an expert in several committees and working groups of the European Commission. And now to Julie. Dr. Julie Quickla is the TW Bennett Professor of Mathematics. Uh, um, she holds degrees in mathematics, chemistry, applied mathematics, and mathematics education, and she serves as the director for STEM education and director of creativity and innovation in STEM at the University of Southern Mississippi. In 2019, uh, Julie was named the Ada Loveless uh, STEM educator, funded by the National Science Foundation Department. Sorry, she's helped with funding uh, with the NSF, National Science Foundation, Department of Defense, NASA, the Kellogg Foundation, the Department of Education, uh, Craig Newmark phil uh, philanthrop phil uh, Philanthropies, uh, Robert uh, Here and Support Foundation, and other other uh, and other and other um, important grant foundations. Uh, she's a recipient of the National Science Foundation's Early Career Award, and she's directed over twenty million dollars in funded research programs. Uh, we encourage everyone to chime in via the via the Zoom chat. Uh, we'll try and answer them. Uh, try to answer all of your questions at the end of the discussion. If there's something that's really pertinent uh, during, we'll try and address it during. Uh, but generally, we save the Q&A for the end. The interview is being recorded, and anyone who wants to uh, get a recording, share it with colleagues, rewatch certain parts that you find to be interesting or informative are welcome to do so following the session. Uh, one more thing before I begin, I just want to take one minute to share a little bit about the company that I run, Academic Language Experts. Um, Academic Language Experts, or ALE for short, uh, we provide customized editing, grant writing and publication support services to researchers, scientists, and other professionals to help them produce publication-ready texts at the highest level. So really anything that has to do with academic writing uh, of any kind, uh, feel free to contact us if you need any support or help. Uh, we also assist scholars looking for help uh, with their book proposals prior to submission to their dream publisher. Um, over the last few years, we've been really, really uh, had the wonderful opportunity to help scholars prepare their grant proposals for the ERC, ISF, uh, GIF, BSF, uh, NSF, National Science Foundation, National, National Institute of Health, Horizon 2020, and many more. Just last month, we received the wonderful news that one of our clients received an ERC advanced grant in the amount of 2.5 million euro that we helped edit, and we were proud uh, to be a part of that. So it's our mission to help authors achieve publications to success and, and become a source of guidance and support throughout their journey. And now, without any further ado, uh, I want to introduce you to uh, Lot and Julie. Lot and Julie, thank you so much for joining me uh, in conversation today. I'm really excited about what we're going to be chatting about. Thanks for having us. I'm looking forward to it as well. And Lot, so really? You... Okay, that, that was my test. I just wanted to make sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine, and thank you again for thank you again for joining us. Um, so I'm kind of curious. I was hoping that just as a, uh, from the outset, you could kind of take us back and tell us a little bit about your own personal backgrounds and how did you get into uh, the field of specializing uh, or helping other scholars um, as well as maybe yourselves with uh, grant uh, submissions to major funding bodies and organizations. How did that come about? 
So maybe Julie, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, so I, I finished my PhD and got a tenure track position, like many of you, I'm sure. And uh, to support my research, I started the money chase. And, and unfortunately, as a graduate student, I really was not taught how to write grant proposals at all. I was taught how to write research papers. And so this is a very different type of writing for me. Um, I also was, was very lucky that I got the NSF Career Award on my first shot. And, um, and then as a result, I started coaching other junior faculty members who were trying to write grant proposals. Apparently, I learned something. I don't know really where I learned it. And, um, and in sharing that through workshops and things, I um, just started coaching others as much as I can. It's, it's a learning, growing process, continually changing with RFPs that come out and, and, and political waves, et cetera. But um, I started the money chase to buy myself time to do the research that I wanted to do and then, and then started teaching others. Do you think a lot has sort of changed in that regard since you were first doing that? I don't know, I'm, I don't know how many years ago, but, or you know, has it gotten, uh, uh, you know, has the chase, has the rat race gotten faster and more competitive or is it sort of similar to when you first started out? I think, I think it's probably still very similar. Um, I think organizations change. Um, like for example, you know, the National Science Foundation now has smaller grants that are for high risk, high reward um, kind of programs. They also have some of their RFPs now are longer timeframes which I think a lot of PIs said, you know, we really, I really need three to five years to do this. Two years isn't going to cut it. Um, so that, so the agencies have been very responsive, I think, to professors along the way and, and the research needs and, and, and emerging technologies as well. Got it. Thanks so much. Um, Lot, yeah, tell us a little bit about your, how you came, how you came to, to, to fill the shoes that you fill today. Well, it was a bit of a strange career, actually. I was hired by, recruited by the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands to become their intellectual pro property lawyer. And because of doing and understanding intellectual property, getting lots of funding to the university, I was gradually also asked, okay, but how do you think about intellectual property in the realm of a grant? How do we need to think about that? And when we talk about the 90s, that's when I started working for the University of Amsterdam, it was a very big issue in Europe. All the grants, uh, the grant money went to the industry and the universities were sort of the suppliers of knowledge, but did not own title to their intellectual property rights. So we were involved from the University of Amsterdam and I was in particular involved in a personal capacity to change that thinking and tell the world, listen, universities have been there for hundreds of years, will be there for hundreds of years more, unless we, have, we own the title to our intellectual property. So that's actually how I got into the whole world of grant writing, where we systematically were being... Once you're in there with the European Commission, they say, okay, you know something about intellectual property, right? How do you think about this? And how, what do you think about that grant? And that sort of made me a very valuable asset to the university because not only I understood intellectual property rights, but I also learned a lot about what is at the core of different types of grants. So that's how I got involved. Nice. And if you ask what has changed yes, over the past please. 30 years, we went from paper and typewriters to electronic submission. That was a huge step before we got paper documents from Brussels and you had to fight for your paper copy that you were allowed to give that to a particular researcher that could then put, take his typewriter and start typing in his application. I would say, yes, digitalization was a huge change. Got it. And, and Lutz, can you tell us, when a, when a scholar comes to you or when you're giving your, you know, classes about really any grant, you know, without getting into specifics of specific grants, um, and before we ever get to the stage of sort of, you know, specking out the different sections, what do you recommend people, how do people come to deciding that they want to, you know, uh, 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 sort of pursue grant funding? And what do you recommend to be the first step? Should people start out with an outline? Should they come up with a research question? Or is it, is it, should it be research they've already sort of been tinkering with that they should be, uh, you know, uh, um, trying to turn into something greater? How, how, where do you usually see the sweet spot in terms of, um, you know, first steps in jotting, in, in, in cultivating a grant? I think this is very different between Julie and me. And if I'm uh, speak as an maybe it's good that we ask Julie first, and then I will speak as the advisor. Maybe that is the best way to do it here. Julie, would you start first because you did it for your yeah? You start first. Sure, sure. 
Um, so I, I typically tell faculty to start off with an idea, something interesting that they, that they wake up in the middle of the night thinking about, like, what is it that you really want to spend your life doing? And that's really important because you don't just chase money to chase money, right? You really want your life and your career and the money to all be aligned ideally. So I always encourage them to really think deeply and keep an idea journal. Write down your ideas all the time. Even if your idea can't come to fruition this year, maybe in five years, you'll revisit that. So an idea journal is the best way. Those ideas then can be distilled down to research questions. And from then, that's where I start the research proposal. And I, I can't underline this any more than, than Julie already has done. It starts, everything starts with the idea. That is at the core of the grant writing process. But for me then immediately, the second thing after that is, and what do you really need? Because the idea is one thing, but do you really need funding for the idea? Um, what kind of funding do you need? So, so I, I went sort of in tandem with idea and need, and then from if there is a need, what is then the question? And then we start to sort out what kind of grants would be useful for submitting to. But the idea, I agree, is crucial. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that, that, that um, one thing that I've noticed in speaking with scholars is that it's really important for them it's really important to sort of identify, first of all, what are those big ideas that are feasible in the time period that you're thinking of that, that, that's reasonable? But those big ideas where you wouldn't be able to pull it off um, without that funding, meaning if you could just kind of do this and funding is a nice bonus, it may not go through. On the flip side, if, you know, it's so big that it's a life project and it may never end and it may go, you know, two or three generations, then that might also be, uh, you know, on the other side of the scale might be too big. And it's sort of, it's an opportunity. Whenever scholars complain to me, well, my research budget is so small, I say, you know, and I can't do the research I'd love to do. Well, that's the opportunity for funding. If you really have a big idea and something novel and, 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 and you know how, you know, more or less, you, you have an idea for how to go out, ahead and accomplish it, but maybe you don't have the internal funding to really um, pursue it. Because there are many, you know, fields in the humanities, for example, where research funding is a nice bonus, but may not be, um, you know, uh, sort of part and parcel of your work cycle. Um, I know that wasn't, that wasn't a question. I apologize. That was more, uh, <laughs> but yeah, go ahead. Follow it up because there is something that goes immediately after that, because you talk about the idea, the big idea, um, you talk immediately about sort of feasibility. And one of the things that comes into play then very early on is what do you know? What do you know that sets you apart from what others have been doing? What makes you, um, what makes your knowledge novel, unique? And why is your idea robust enough to be able to investigate? So I would immediately seek for preliminary evidence. And preliminary evidence may be very different across fields. I mean, if you're in a theoretical field, I, of course, ask you about your theoretical insights. If you are more in a field um, that is in the life sciences, I will ask you for your data. If you are in the humanities, I'm asking what kind of uh, preliminary projects have you done and what kind of understanding has emerged from that that allows you to provide us with data or insight that this is a robust idea. And I think that positioning is really important, thinking geographically, but also intellectually, like Lai just said, you know, what has brought you to this time and space right now? What, you know, what is that, what unique experiences in education bring you to maybe it's an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary place that you are uniquely positioned to answer a particular question? Maybe it's with a, with a group of human subjects, maybe it's with a particular museum partner, um, but what makes this situation and this time and place unique that you need half a million dollars or half a million euros to do X, Y, Z. Yeah, no, I think that's, I, I, yeah, those, are, those are really interesting insights. I'm curious to hear from both of you whether, um, you know, you talked a little bit about the preliminary results and preliminary research, right? So just an idea is not enough necessarily to get off the ground. Um, that being said, if, e e what, what exactly do we need in order to have a basis or a solid enough foundation in order to seek out funding? Can these preliminary results be from my own research or should they be from other scholars? And how do you recommend to scholars to sort of um, build out the 
the background of the literature literature review. Because on the one hand, we have to be, there's sort of a contradiction in terms. Well, on the one hand, we have to be, you know, super, um, you know, uh, novel. It's got to be something totally new. On the other hand, if it's so novel that there's no proof that, um, that it's going to work or there's no sort of preliminary evidence, that can also get us into trouble. So how do you, where's that sort of golden medium that you advise your scholars to take? So, so I think it, it obviously needs to be couched and placed really well in the literature. You need to show that you know your field very well. However, in the US and I'm sure other places, there are specific requests for proposals, RFPs, that are for junior faculty members. So they are not expecting a brand new assistant professor with or without a postdoc to be able to conduct a huge large scale study or to have three years of data that they can provide. Um, so I think it really depends on the RFP. There are RFPs for people who are more junior with less experience. Um, but in any case, you know, there, there's a, people always joke that, you know, once they apply for a grant, they think, well, I ha had to do the whole thing before I got the money to do it, right? I ha had to do all the work before I even got the money. And so you obviously don't have to do all of that. But if there is some pilot data, if you can show that you've done a little tiny mini version of the project or, or a component of it to show, I know my stuff, I know where this fits in the field. And look, I've done this little piece of it already. And if you give me more money, I can keep building on that. And so it's really telling the right story about your position, what you've been able to do so far, and then thinking about where you are in your, in your career at that point and finding the right match for, for your experience level so that you're not competing against someone who's been doing this for 20 years. You're competing against someone just like yourself. And one of the things with the preliminary data or the preliminary evidence is you want to show that there is merit of funding this idea. So that's the concept where you talk about this is the novel idea, this is the novel underlying idea of what I want to pursue, or this is the novelty of my approach, that it is robust enough to start the investigation. And I emphasize here the word start, because what your reviewers are going to do is they're going to ask, first of all, is it robust? And then the second thing they want to see, have you generated that insight? Can we therefore trust your analysis because you know more than others know because you have more insight into this question, into this concept of what the, the limitations are of it, what the strength is of it. But then where is the balance? When do you have too much preliminary insight? And that depends a little bit of the type of grant, of course. It depends a bit about what kind of career stage you're in because if there are no more questions there, if it is just you have all the information and you have just to glue it together and in the gluing it together to the big picture, there is not really a challenge, a, a scientific exploration going on, then the question is, is, is it then interesting to fund? So quite often when it is about research funding, they really want you to bring in insights from your own work that insight needs to give the, so, uh, the robustness to the foundation. Yes, we can now start funding this, but there are still many questions that we now can, because we have this insight, that we can now explore. And that will gradually over time allow us to get to the answers of the question that we're looking for. But without further questions or objectives or aims, it depends just completely on the wording of what you need to bring forward to the grant, I would say it is difficult that maybe you have too much information and you just should do the analysis and get the publications out. Got it. And, and you both mentioned career stage, and I'm curious to hear from you about whether there's sort of, uh, you know, do you recommend a buildup um, of scholars a long time uh, in terms of their, I, I guess I would call it their, you know, grant CV. What I mean by that is, is that is a, you know, a, a, a scholar that just got, you know, just recently got a, a, a you know, a tenured position. Um, are they going to be able to win a big grant or should they start with smaller grants? And what if my research is, what if I am a young, young ambitious researcher and, or, you know, a more junior researcher, but I have really, you know, sort of ambitious goals and a big project in mind. Um, what do I do? How do I, you know, apply for that funding if it's not necessarily, you know, available to me? Is it a matter of teaming up with other people? How do you, how do you approach these questions? So I, I always encourage people if they feel they're ready, they're ready. And, um, you know, my first, I, I got a very small little internal award, a, a fellowship when I got to this university 
um, for about $2,500. That was the only thing I had before I got half a million dollars. So I don't think you need to do the baby steps to get up, you know, to walk up the financial ladder. Um, I, I really think you just need a very good idea um, and you need to sell it compellingly. So I don't think, you know, and the money has to follow the work. You can't say, well, I need a million dollars to do X when X only costs $10,000, which really is some travel and maybe some visits to some labs. So it all just needs to make sense. The money needs to follow the work and the work needs to follow the ideas. And if that happens, there's no reason you can't ask for $2 million if that's really what you need, because you need a half a million dollar piece of equipment and you need the summer salary to, to support things and you need to hire two graduate students, but the money needs to follow the work. So I don't think there's any reason not to ask for big, big grants. Now, your university or your agency or where you work would, would have some guidance for this as well. Um, so for example, if you're a junior faculty, you're not gonna, you likely would not be applying for a $10 million equipment grant, let's say. That would probably be for a lab or a group of people. But for an individual to go for a half a million or a million dollars or even 1.5 million at their, at their junior introductory you know, assistant professor level, that's completely reasonable. And I would agree with this because um, go to your university, go to the grant office at your university, talk to them because they have such a broad overview of any type of grants, uh, small grants, big grants, and it all depends on what, what you need at that moment, what your idea is, how big the idea is, whether you can, whether you can step indeed, Im immediately make the big step to a big grant or whether um, it's more suitable to do a, a smaller grant first, what makes you feel comfortable, and this is what we did at our office, and I think many offices uh, do the same thing. You build up relationships with your, with, with your researchers, and you know sort of uh, where they're starting out, what they are doing, what they are needing, and then you start bombarding them with opportunities. And then the, the scientists will say, okay, there is, there is too much, I can't, you know, follow everything. And that's what you need to pick and choose, and you need to have people that help you in what is now the most opportune, best kind of grant for the kind of research that you want to submit now for your ideas. So, yeah. yeah. Now, money money comes from different places and different, you know, shapes and forms. And, and, and putting aside for a minute amounts, um, and, and, and can you both address sort of how you would categorize different types of funders and maybe maybe even just tell us a little bit about kind of different approaches to take for each one. I'm not talking about, you know, specifically getting into the nitty gritty of a particular NIH grant. I'm talking more about, you know, their, you know, funding can come from, you know, research grants that we're probably all familiar with and get uh, information about from our university, but there's also government grants, private foundations may be interested in your field of research. So even just mapping out sort of the field of, who would potentially be interested in funding my project, that in itself can be its own research project. So how do you sort of advise, um, you know, scholars who are, you know, new to, 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 to funding applications or maybe just haven't have tried before but haven't been successful to, to, to find the where um, it might be most appropriate? Do you want me to start, Lot? <laughs> um... I, I guess, um... You know, there are certain certain federal agencies and larger agencies, sometimes you have more latitude on what you can propose. Um, sometimes smaller foundations or even family foundations will have very specific goals and missions that might be more narrow. That's not always the case. Some private foundations have very wide scope. But um, in, uh, typically, though, I think with a, at a national level, you can get, um, you can just address larger research questions. You have, a, and you also have a little more latitude. Um, a family organization might be 10 people who are being stewards of family money or, or company money, and they have a very narrow mission. Um, so I think it's really looking at, you know, I always encourage PIs to look at the websites, look at who's on the website, look at who the board is. Think about who are the reviewers, right? So in a national setting, the reviewers are anybody. The reviewers are the people on this call. They are, you, they are your peers. They are a, a national audience, whereas a smaller foundation uh, or a small company or a large company, that might that those reviewers look very different. So I always try to encourage writers to think about who is your reader? Who is going to be reviewing this? Who is going to be judging this work? And then move backwards from there. Because you're not writing for yourself. You're writing for your reader. If I take this from a European perspective, we have at Europe, we have now a very big funding program. And basically what we see there happening over the years is that you have um, collaborative 
funding. And we, what we mean by that is that you need to collaborate with a team, a team coming from different countries, uh, because this is Europe, you know, we have all these small countries. So we want to establish collaborations between these countries and between universities um, and others. And that means then other sectors like companies or patient groups or other stakeholders. So that's if you have a kind of question that you already feel that goes outside the scope of just the academic environment and just an academic group, then maybe collaborative kind of projects. But they come with a disadvantage in Europe because they are predefined, there are predefined um, topics. And that narrow sort of when you can submit there, it is only when that topic is open for funding, when there is a call for funding, that you then need to pull in all these strings from everybody to get, oh, let's now move into this collaborative project. And then there is the personal grant, where there are very different types of personal grants. And some grants are for really big projects, five years, millions of euros that you talked about, Avi or some of them are much, much small, smaller, are for you individually to really expand your um, career um, uh, scope in, in terms of methodologies and scope of what you can investigate. So these are, for example, two very, very different national, of, uh, European funding, it is, collaborative, individual. But then if you, and this is what I also see what, uh, what Julie is saying, is that Yes, you have the private fund funding. We have national funding then also, and we have private funding. And again, the same thing can happen as what Julie says. Uh, some of them have a very open and are very open and broad. Some are very specific and dedicated. Bill and Melinda Gates, very big, but very focused, very dedicated to certain types of, of proposals. I know in Denmark, they have very open funding because there's a tax reduction for companies if they have... Um, if they if they give out research funding and therefore they are very open, very big and open. So it it you need to take stock of what is happening in your country, in your region where you're living, and you know maybe you can also participate across borders and you can uh, as a European participate in American funding as an American in European funding. There are all kinds of possibilities. But you need to talk to your grant officers, I would say, who knows these schemes and would say, okay, well, maybe this suits you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, there's so many interesting, so many good points that you, that you're making here. I really like the, you know, the, the, uh, thinking about, you know, the, the collaborations with other universities. I've seen a lot of, you know, success with sort of those, uh, with, with, with collaborations that really cross borders and, but where the, where the scholars complete each other. Um, in terms of their areas of expertise and in terms of their knowledge base and, and subject knowledge, because I think that that's, you know, it's it, it, in many ways, it's easier to apply for a personal grant. It's like, okay, I know exactly what I want to do. I know how I'm going to do it. I'm going to control the timeline. Uh, but sometimes those are more limited and maybe that's a good stepping stone. Um, but some of these real big, you know, sort of breakthrough grant opportunities really require us to be good team leaders and managers and sometimes even, you know, uh, sometimes even really kind of get into the nitty gritty of the funding details and how much we're asking for it. And how do you, so, so I guess I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll turn this into a question. How do you recommend, you know, these are all skill sets, which we may or may not have as scholars, um, you know, uh, how to approach building a budget and how to build, approach building a team. So how do you recommend sort of coming, you know, handling some of those questions? Because I think they're really, critical for your chances of success, um, you know, if, if the funders pick up on some hesitancy or that you don't really know who, who's, who on your team is going to do what or what roles they have or what skills they have, maybe there's more hesitancy in, in funding your proposal. So I guess with the budget, I, again, the, the budget needs to follow the work. So I make sure once I, once I, and I always have kind of in my mind, okay, this is how much salary approximately is going to be happening. This is how many graduate students I need. This is how many lab techs. This is how many people in the field or partners that we're going to give a consulting fee to. Um, so there's always sort of those kinds of monies. And then obviously larger monies, if there are things for large equipment costs, those need to be in your mind. But then there are all the, all the smaller things that really make a project work. And that might be someone who is going to do the money, who is going to be doing the budget, who's going to be assisting, someone who might be taking track of any equipment and supplies that you buy or helping with purchasing. Um, so there are all those kinds of small things to be thinking through. I think as I'm doing the idea, 
as I'm coming up with the proposal itself, I'm making sure, as Lottie mentioned earlier, there's sort of this parallel thinking. You're thinking about the budget as you're thinking about the project. Um, so I think as long as those things are aligned, that can, that can work out really well. I do suggest ask somebody to share their budget. Say, can you give me a budget or ask your sponsored programs, can you give me a budget so I have an Excel sheet or some kind of format that I can play with? And then you can start plugging in numbers. There's something in the US, we call it fringe, and that's sort of an add-on of our salary that covers our, 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 our healthcare, our retirement. So there are all these little numbers, all these terms that you probably are not familiar with until you see someone else's budget. And I think that's really interesting, especially when you're talking about overhead. Most organizations have some level of overhead. That might be 10%, that could be 110%. You fall somewhere in there and, um, and figuring all that out can be helpful just to have a template to start from. Lottie, I'll let you answer that and then I'll come back to the team's question. Okay, um, yeah, I, I wanted to go to the team and then you can pick it up from there, is that okay? Perfect. Okay, um, with the team, I, I, I always look at what is the personal capacity of the lead PI, yeah, the, the, person, the, the principal investigator. And I'm looking at, okay, what, is, what have you done? What is your expertise? And then I start sort of to see, um, can you do everything that you're proposing? Is there a grant here that you can ask for other team members? Then we need to look, carefully look at who are they? And let's see the personal grant where you can apply for a team. That is a little bit simpler than a, than a collaborative effort. Then you can start, then you really have to think carefully. If you're very young in your career and you have hardly done any supervision, you need to be careful by taking on board only PhD students because you need to train them. That will take a lot of your effort uh, to train them. So it, it takes, you have less time to work really on the complex questions. And then maybe you need to think in postdocs. And if you think in postdocs, you don't want to have clones of who you are. You want to have people who have already independence, have a great overview that can work on a part of the questions in collaboration with you, but have really added value. So. Um, if you're more established in your career, you can, of course, more freely think about these issues because you have already a lot of experience with training PhDs. You see what their capacity is, also their limitations, so you can carefully balance between PhDs and postdocs. But quite often, as a more experienced researcher, you can also bring higher level uh, researchers into your project without feeling that they will overshadow you so that there is confusion. Who is now actually the principal investigator, the young scientist or the person already having made a name? So these kind of things um, for a personal grant, I would really take that into the discussion. Back to you, Julie. Yeah, and I think what you just mentioned about having senior mentors on a project, you can always build in you know, a little bit of money, a couple thousand dollars to have somebody mentor you throughout the grant. Um, a lot of organizations now encourage an advisory board. So that advisory board isn't doing the work, but you meet with them once a year or you meet with them twice, four times a year. And you say, here's what we've done. What advice do you have? And you give, you, you're paying these other scholars to give you advice and to help you grow as a researcher. And that's a really great way, not only to network, but to really grow yourself as a, as a scientist, as a researcher, as a human, because you're interacting with these people who maybe are your heroes that you think, oh, I, I could never work with that person. Well, ask them to be on your board. Ask them to give you a little bit of their time and maybe that's a half day at a conference that you both will go to. Can you please have lunch with me or can I come and visit you? And these are ways that they can mentor you and mentoring is, is a two-way street. It's, it's, it's very enjoyable to so find people who enjoy doing that um, and that will really help you grow as a scientist for sure. Now, I wanna to touch on the, there, there's sort of an inbuilt tension I think when it comes to teasing out your grant idea or your research question in that, we generally come with an idea, something that we're really passionate about that we want to explore, something that we can't do maybe, you know, in our current setup. But then the funding bodies have their own, you know, sort of agenda and uh, preferences and topics that they choose. Um, and obviously we're, you know, if we find something that's a perfect fit, well, then great. Um, but I'm curious, but I imagine that, that there are often times whereby we kind of have to, we feel like we're, you know, putting a square peg into a, into a circle um, and trying to get what we care about into what they care about. So can you talk about that tension a little bit and how you uh, move scholars along so that they can actually, on the one hand, do the research they want to do, but on the flip side, um, have a chance of it being funded because it actually answers 
a need that's defined by the funding bodies. Yeah, so this is a tricky dance and, I, and one that you wanna make sure that you're getting done what you want to do and what your lab wants to do or what your group wants to do. Um, but for example, like Lottie was mentioning, maybe, maybe it's a, an, an organization that is actually um, encouraging collaboration across institutions, across countries. Um, I have a colleague who is, is digitizing some historical papers that have never been digitized. And so that's, that's a perfect example of something that could be an international project, right? You find somebody who is also working in that very specific historical period of time, maybe, or with that particular population. Um, and, and you can create a synergy. Like you could imagine that being a web of 10 people doing this across the world. And so I, I think it's, it's a combination of figuring out what it is that you wanna do. And then if it is an international co collaboration, find out, think about ways more broadly that you could find partners to do that. Um, and that might not always be in your department. It might not always be at your institution. Um, and even politically, it might not be best to choose someone in your, in your department. You have to be really careful about that. I know a lot of junior faculty members will wanna choose a team member in the department who's a senior member because they think that that's gonna somehow help them in the future. And that's not the case. The work and the research has to drive the team. Right, so you wanna make sure you're aligning, like, like we just said, make sure you're adding people to the team who are, who are contributing in the way that you cannot. And so again, that person might be at your back door or in the next office, or they might be in, in the next state or the next country. Yeah, if I, if I now take this back to, you have the idea, you see a grant. Um, this could be a personal grant scheme, and there are two different types of personal grant schemes. One says, uh, this is for career enhancement, and the other says, this is for opening new research horizons. I really go back to what is the funding agency's objective with this funding, and whether this is a public, because I'm not talking about a funding agency from uh, the European Commission, but this could equally be true for an industrial fund for research or a private fund for research. It doesn't really matter. And quite often, one of the, the things that I think you need to do is you need to spend some time about really conceptualizing what do they mean with this, opening up new research horizons? Is that clear to me? What do they mean with career enhancement? What do they mean with um, training the next generation of scientists? And once you understand their language, because everybody chooses their own language to present a grant, once you get an understanding about that, you start to discuss, if this is about a collaborative grant, you start to discuss with the key persons in your collaborative grant, do we understand the same thing? Or because you're coming from a different uh, direction than I am coming, have we a different understanding of what they're actually asking? And quite often that stage will take some time to digest. It takes some time to get consultations about, to let it, sink into your brain as to what is it that you actually want from me and can I can I meet that? Am I willing to meet that? Because that's the other thing. I mean, maybe you can, but you're like, well, I'm not interested in training the next generation. I'm interested in opening new research horizons. So this is a very careful process. And I think that across the world, uh, any grant office will provide you with sessions, information sessions, just join them. If you find it a waste of time at the end of the day, you say, okay, this is not for me, then you have just wasted one day or a couple of hours in that day to make the analysis. This is not what I am interested in. That's great. That's great because then you can focus back on, on, on doing the research, doing uh, what you're good at. Instead of writing two months, because I, I think quite often these things take Take two months to really get to a level of maturity that you can submit your pro proposal. And then concluding at the end of the two months, oh, actually, I can't meet what their, what, what their expectation is because I'm not interested in that. That is a waste of time. And I had to laugh because I, I know Julie wrote a, a fantastic book. I recommend it to everybody to read it. You read it in just a couple of hours. You will smile. You will laugh about it. And then I hit sort of one of her last chapters, and it was the chapter about, unfortunately, that letter that was coming in from the funding agency. And it starts with that word, unfortunately, you know, you didn't get the grant. And I, I, I have applied several grants for myself, but most of the time I see these letters from people that I've worked with. 
even I, I can't open that letter. I feel it as, I know it is not a personal rejection. It's just a rejection of the idea and it was not good enough or not well explained. But it feels personally and I need to take some distance to it before I can accept it. But this is the thing with grant writing. Once you feel that there is a match between your idea and the funding agency, you start writing it. If they do not accept your ideas, then it should not be wasted time. You have spent time thinking very deeply about the kind of research you want to pursue. And if it is not this time, then maybe it is the next submission, the rewritten submission. Maybe it is uh, another type of grant and you take it into another direction. But you have now the advantage of having had feedback, very thorough feedback quite often, not always, but in many cases, thorough feedback. And then you just take it into that other direction or into, or you give it a new spin and we submit. But I had to laugh so much, Judy, you had no idea. I was like sitting there and said, yes, I've just gone through that whole process of seeing acceptances and rejections. And yeah, it is, uh, it's difficult, but this is how you, you pave your way to success, I would, I would say. Oh, for sure. Anybody who applies for grants frequently has a pile of rejection letters as well, as do I. <laughs> and it's important to understand why they were rejected. Um, as you said, sometimes you get really detailed, amazing reviews. I mean, people are really, people in general are good, right? And they're very caring. And I think scholars want to give feedback to other scholars. And, um, and yeah. oftentimes it'll help redirect or reshape your idea. So um, I'm not saying to submit something you don't think is ready just to get the reviews, but do understand even when it's rejected, you will get good feedback. You will get good feedback. Yeah, and I, I will also add from my perspective that I've seen a number of rejections, uh, even more, I would say more so recently, of where there were three positive reviews and it came back with a rejection. And it's simply because there's a certain, the pie is only so large and, for, you know, each funding body has their own priorities and their own, you know, criteria or decision-making processes. But there are proposals which are, are very good and, get rejected because they have some sort of cap and limit in terms of how much money can be awarded. So, you know, I recently got a consult, you know, we, we were consulting on a, on a, on a rejected proposal and I looked over the, and I, you know, the first thing I asked for is the proposal and the reviews of, of, of rejection and all the reviewers were stellar. And I said, you know what, I'm not going to waste your money in, you know, in, in, in doing a whole nother review here. You just have to keep, you just have to try a different place or try this place next year or, you know, because it really was just, you know, it, it really would just seem like it was a busy year in terms of the number of applications that they received. So there's almost always what to improve. And, you know, as, as, as human beings and as scholars, we're always learning along the process. And you're right, those reviews can be really helpful. But it's also, you know, I think emotionally, it can be challenging the first few times you get a, a rejection letter to just say, well, is this mean that my entire you know world my research is not valuable not important i'm wrong um all these sort of self-doubt that creeps in and 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 don't doubt yourself you know it, it's it, often, most of the time it, it does not have to do with the quality of the research and even if it does you know it's a learning process and look at it as a long-term learning process and not you know a, a acceptance or rejection straight out um i want to get to i want to yeah sorry did you want to add something Lizzie? More thing because it is sort of linking into that where do you start as a young scientist and maybe one of the things that I like for young scientists is that they apply for personal grants where they really only focus on the science and not too many other things so that they really can learn about how to write good science and if they are then rejected they can then start to reuse these ideas and become better because sometimes grants ask so many different things that you see that the science is from the 10 pages that you have, the science is two and a half page and seven and a half page are about other stuff. And I wouldn't start with those type of grants then quite often. For sure. Um, I wanna ask you about what I, what I actually think is an over, maybe a bit of an overused word, um, but it seemed to be a buzzword that in almost every application now, uh, which is impact. Um, and I think it probably means many different things to many different people in different contexts, but, um, you know, I think at a, on a very basic level, it means um, beyond your theoretical conclusions of your study, 
um, what difference is it going to make? Sometimes that's difference just within your scholarly, you know, uh, you know, community or within your colleagues. Sometimes that means on the general public, it actually might it might have an impact on policy in your country, in your region. Um, it may have an impact on future research. So, can you try and sort of um, shed light on how you know what how you see funders using this? Now, this sort of uh, key term and what you recommend to scholars to do, because it's something that we kind of have to think about already before while we're doing the research planning. We can't we don't have the luxury of saying we'll do the research and then we'll see whether it makes a difference or not, which sometimes is really the only way to understand, but is to think about that from the outset. Yeah, I mean, broader broader impacts are so important. And I and to me, I always think of this as the who cares. So who actually cares but beyond the funding agency, beyond the X number of people that are gonna read your publication. Who cares, who's going to care, who's going to be impacted? Um, this, like you said, it's very important to think about as you're writing the proposal, because oftentimes as a reviewer, when I'm looking at a, at a proposal, it's very clear when it's the add-on, or it's the, uh, they, they brought somebody in to say, hey, give me some broader impacts of this work. And it really feels like they're, they're squishing the cake onto the cake that's been built. And so um, it's, it's really important to be thinking about that along the way, whether that's science communication, whether that's an outreach program in the community, whether that is a, a you know a, a webinar that you're giving for X number of teachers in a region, um, just be thinking about that component and where that might pop up or where that might integrate well into the research plan itself and into the timeline that you create. Because again, that will make your work more meaningful. It will make it more rich. It also does not have to be something that you are doing or you are ahead of you could have somebody who is going to be an outreach coordinator, let's say. That could be someone else that you hire to do some of that component. Or maybe this is a smaller program and you're going to actually do the science communication itself. You know, we are, we are hopefully at the end of a pandemic, but we are in a pandemic in particular because of the way scientists and scholars communicate information. And we're not very good at doing that. And I think we're only going to see more of this requirement and requests and RFPs along the way. Because we need to do a better job instead of just speaking to our PhD community, we need to speak to everybody and share what we're finding in ways that are consumable by as many people as possible. Yeah, if I, if I may add there something, for those of you who are interested in, in from very collaborative projects working on very fundamental problems, well, fundamental, let's say foundational problems because the solutions could be applied, they could be more theoretical. Um, what I see is that in EU settings, we are very, we try to make it very explicit what the impact is that we expect from that particular project that you're submitting for this particular problem. We, we even identify who your stakeholders are. And of course, you're encouraged to think beyond that. But then there are always three layers. There's always the layer of science scientific, as Julie was also saying. So you're, you're, you always have to satisfy your reviewers who are in the majority of the reviewers, always scientific. So you must make sure that the reviewers understand why you contribute to the scholarship in your field and how you go beyond that. And then it, it really depends on the nature of the problem that you are tackling in that collaborative issue, um, how you need to articulate that the results that you have obtained that you can really present to your scholarly community, which groups, which other groups would benefit to know that this kind of science is happening. And therefore, the, the Judy formulated as who cares, and I formulated as who benefits to know, but these are, are things that will be really helpful in opening your mind. And then you need to think about um, is there further research possibilities of the results? Does it, will it be shelved? Then in general, in the European Union, you will get a slap on the wrist because that is not the idea about the research that you're doing. They want you to show that at least it can be used for further research so that you really think about, okay, this is the community that I directly target through my, through my publications and my conferences, but we have also contributions methodologically that would be tremendously important for the community. And then that would allow further research. If we create these kind of databases, it would allow further research. If we have this kind of mechanistic understanding, it would then evoke further research in the community. That is one way of 
looking at exploitation in the European Union context. And then it comes down to commercial. They want, from time to time, very clearly to see, okay, if you're, if you're uh, in the business of biomarkers, we're looking for a project that can define biomarkers. Who is going to exploit these biomarkers? Are you going to protect them with a patent? Are you then going to uh, license that to a company? Are you going to set up um, a startup company on this? They want to know. This is in the bigger collaborative projects. We have personal projects where people are asked and pushed to think also in these lines, but from a personal project perspective. But then we have totally different projects where they are only interested in how do you impact on science? And how will you change the direction of science with the kind of contributions that you can uh, get out of this project? So carefully analyze what funding you are applying for. What is the focus of that funding? And if the focus, they have a very strong focus on impact with impact going beyond the scholarly community, then sit down, dig deep into the question, and then use that who cares and who benefits kind of exercise to see if you go beyond your classical uh, routes of dissemination, I would say, or routes of dissemination. It's... Uh, Amazing. I, there's so much more that I want to ask you about, but I, I'm, I'm cautious of time and I want to make sure that we, we stick to our hour that we promised everyone. Um, so I just want to follow. First of all, I want to encourage anyone who has any follow up questions, um, feel free to jot them down in the chat. Um, but I want to follow up with one final question um, for both of you. And that is, um, first of all, I, would, I was hoping you could talk about, you know, getting help, um, because I think that maybe there's sort of uh, this feeling that, oh, I should know how to do this from the womb. But really, you know, I think we all know that that's not, that's not true and we all need help. So what kind of help and support is out there? Um, and it's also just an opportunity uh, for both of you if you have you know, any resources or, or courses that you wanna share um, with the crowd, I'm happy for you to plug. Um, I think you both do great work in your own sort of unique individual ways. Julie on the American side and let's, on the um, European side, and just tell us a little bit more about how they can find out more information about you know, the particular work that you do. Sure, as Lottie mentioned, I, I wrote a book, Good to Great Grant Writing. Um, it's a very fast read for busy people just like you and um, has a lot of just hints and ideas. Um, in addition, on my webpage, there are a lot of resources and PDFs that you can print out and actually work through um, research ideas, actually sketch out a budget, um, answer some questions about methods and timelines. So there's sort of a, an outline there. I'm actually working on an online class right now and um, I'm teaching that this fall, and that will be an expanded version of the book that came from, from kind of shorter workshops. Um, I do encourage just in general for people to share your writing. Writing is a very private personal activity, and sometimes it's hard to put that out there, but find writing partners, find writing groups. Um, I know one of my colleagues gets up at four o'clock every morning and writes with some women around the world that they all just get up and they're all on their screens and they're, it's, a, it's an accountability process because the writing is hard. It is the hardest thing I think that humans do. It's getting the ideas out of our head and articulated well so that another human can understand it. And the resistance to doing that work is very fierce, right? You have emails, you have students knocking on the door, you have family responsibilities. It is very hard to make time to write. So really do that because if you are a good writer, you will be successful in anything that you do. Amazing. The way we work is we are following the schedule of the European grants, and so there, there are always calls out there. And if you are interested in that, and whether you're in Europe or not, that doesn't matter, but you need to be interested in collaborating with Europeans, or if it's a personal grant, to move to Europe to conduct the grant. I would say you find a university that you would like to go to and work with. And find out where the grant office is, because we work together with the grant offices. The grant offices call us in and say, okay, can you now give a day training on this issue? Can you give a day training on that issue? And then we gradually follow up with the grant office on the people that were there that day. What are their ideas and how are they now putting that into proposals? Are they ready? Yes or no? So use the grant offices of the universities. Right. 
Right, that's fantastic, and I, I think that it's it's amazing because all three you you could probably benefit from 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 Julie's work, Loti's work, and also our work. Um, we we kind of come in a little bit later in the process where we help scholars uh, once they already have a proposal written and they want someone to review it and you know external reviewer before they send it off for submission or they need help with with the writing and the language. Um, so that's really something that we can we can help with as well. So you know hopefully hopefully you'll be able to make the best uh, maximize um, you know all of the resources uh, that are here. Um, yeah, that's it. Well, I just wanted to say how helpful that service has been uh, that you're offering because, I mean, I come from Europe where not everybody is a native English speaker. So we have, I don't know how many, how many languages right now. And that means that we're always uh, limited sort of in our freedom in how to express things. We may have brilliant ideas, but not the most smooth way of expressing it. And that's what I have seen of working with edit good ed editors like yourself and your group. Is it is truly important. It transforms how it is perceived at the other end because if it is easy read, it is already so tough. Well, it, your your topic is difficult also for your reviewers because they are seldom the, the in depth expert that they can just read it. So it helps. It really helps. Indeed, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so Alana, if you could put up on the screen now, if anyone w does want to follow up. Uh, individually with any of us, um, you are welcome to go ahead and do so. Um, you can take a quick minute now just to jot down our email. You've also got the um, links to the personal websites uh, and, and uh, to Yellow Research here. So um, please do, you know, on your free time, go ahead and check that out uh, to make sure that you're, you're getting most of uh, of, of the session today and, and of everything that, that, that they have to offer. Um, I also want to encourage everyone uh, to check out our future events. Um, we've got an event uh, coming up that I can share with everybody here. Uh, just one minute here. Um, so we've got an event. We have an event every month for those who aren't familiar, um, always having to do with, oh, my apologies, always having to do with the world of academic publication. Seems like I next off. Okay, here we go. Um, and uh, coming up in July, we, we will have an event that we'll be publicizing in June. It's not finalized yet. Uh, coming up in July, we're going to be talking about how to turn your dissertation into a book or what we have seen more and more of recently is turning your dissertation into a series of articles. So we're going to be interviewing uh, Beth Louie, who is the author of the Handbook for Academic Authors. So the authority of all authorities um, in, this, in this field. <laughs> Highly encourage you uh, to attend. Uh, we'll drop a, Alana will drop a link into the uh, chat so that you have the ability to check that out further as well. Um, I did not see any, uh, any questions in the chat, which must be uh, just further proof of how clear Julie and Lut, uh were and uh, that they were self-explanatory. But if anyone does want to uh, uh, drop a question uh, into the chat, um, you're welcome to uh, go ahead and do so. Uh, now, um, and either way, we're about at full time. So, um, so I want to take this opportunity really to thank uh, both of you uh, for for your time and and for your insights. Um, and I think that you know my takeaway here is that um, is that it's a difficult process. You have to kind of come in prepared, knowing that it might not that there's there's going to be revisions and rewritings, and that may even lead to a rejection. But if you approach it right from the outset. Um, and you have a strategy and you have a plan um, and you realize that it's a long term, uh, you know, the goal here is long term and not necessarily always, you know, to, to publish tomorrow, but rather to, 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 to springboard your career um, and bring it to new heights, then um, then grants are definitely something that you want to consider if, you know, as, as appropriate. So thanks again uh, to everyone for coming to uh, Julie and Lotti and uh, until next month. Um, take care. <laughs>